Thank you uh, very much, uh, Pippa, for that. Uh, indeed, I want to thank all the organizers, as, as many have done, but I don't think we can have a surplus of gratitude uh, in the direction of the organizers for this uh, conference. I also want to thank the reviewers from the journal who have already waded through uh, this particular paper and have provided us with some very uh, useful feedback. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in uh, Cambridge. Uh, I spent uh, three years living uh, just over the other side of Harvey Court, where the barbecue uh, will be. So it's nice to be uh, back. Uh, you'll notice uh, that uh, we have a double billed uh, paper. Vaughn Black, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, my co-author on this paper, and I are, are billed to talk about this. Uh, Vaughn is not here, uh, and that was always part of the plan. Vaughn is uh, much more environmentally uh, conscious than I am, and so his carbon footprint didn't allow his travel from uh, North America to England. Uh, I'm, I guess, uh, crueler to the planet uh, than he is, so I'm here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm happy to be here, frankly. Uh, I am, though, as, as Pippa mentioned, a little distracted. Uh, at 3 o'clock uh, local time, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, rendered uh, a fairly important decision that we've been waiting on for nine months. Uh, and in paragraph 67, the court explains that not only am I wrong, but I am spectacularly wrong um, on a point that I set out in my uh, text on conflict of laws in, in 2010. Uh, I'm in the process of starting to revise that uh, book, uh, and so that will be my opportunity to actually explain back to the court that I'm not wrong, and uh, I'm going to stick to my guns, I think, on, on the point. I, I'll allege that they got it wrong uh, for whatever benefit that does me, which is probably none. Um, let me start, I guess, by saying a little bit, very generally, about forum selection clauses, because uh, there are some ground rules I think we, we collectively know uh, fairly well. We're of the view that, that forum selection clauses should be presumptively enforced, and we think, I guess, or there's a, there's a school of thought, I suppose, that says forum selection clauses are contractual clauses like any other. They're part of a contract, they're terms of a contract. We should give them effect, like we give effect to other terms of a contract. And that efficiency and certainty and fairness all argue in favor of enforcing forum selection clauses. But if we're sticking to our understanding of, of basic contract fundamentals, we also run up against this notion of privity of contract. And I almost didn't make it here for this conference because what I didn't know was that one of the criteria for being allowed into the country uh, was that the people at Border Force, and that's a scary name for me as a Canadian, it sounds like something Donald Trump would create to monitor his American border. <laughs> um, the people at Border Force actually won't let you in if they don't like the thesis of the proposal that you're presenting at the conference you're attending. So I got into a very detailed discussion with, with the fellow about why I was coming, what my topic was, what my contention was, and he looked at me. So I said to him, well, my contention is that I'm going to talk about the extent to which forum selection clauses can bind non parties and he said, but they're non-parties. <laughs> Privity means that they can't be bound. And I practically picked up my luggage and headed back to the plane. But I, I, managed, I managed to convince him that there was at least some benefit to hearing me out on the point, and so you get to hear me out on, on, on the point. And we're looking at, the, the paper is filled with a number of uh, hypothetical scenarios. Uh, we don't have cartoony figures like one of the earlier papers that describe each of the scenarios. Uh, but the scenarios illustrate the number of different ways uh, that forum selection clauses can have effects on uh, non-signatories. And those effects can, depending on the scenario, either be a burden or a benefit to, to the non-signatory. They can be a burden in that the non-signatory might end up being subjected to a jurisdiction that absent the clause, they couldn't be sued in. That, that would be a burden flowing from the clause. Another burden would be that as plaintiff, the non-signatory, now if caught by the clause, would be precluded from suing in fora in which it otherwise might have been able to bring proceedings. But correspondingly, there will be scenarios where there will also be benefits that can flow to the non-signatory if the clause uh, is held to apply, both by permitting the non-signatory to now sue in a forum that otherwise would have been unavailable. Right? The clause creates an opportunity for the non-signatory uh, to bring proceedings, otherwise in which it couldn't proceed. Um, and it also creates them, the non-signatory, to advance as a defendant arguments against being sued in a particular place, 
on the basis, among other things, that they really should be being sued in the other place, the place that's set out in the clause. In other words, the benefits that we typically think flow to contracting parties to jurisdiction clauses or form selection clauses. And what the article picks up particularly is some recent American cases that look at something called a closely related test or a closely related doctrine. And so there are American court decisions that say that a non-party to a form selection clause can nonetheless get either the benefit or the burden, as the case may be, of that clause if that non-signatory is closely related. And we'll have to explain a little bit more about what that means and how that test might operate. And so that's, our, that's what we're playing with in the, in the article. We're looking at the extent to which that this closely related test could get picked up in Canada and looking at whether a Canadian court, because this has not happened in a Canadian decision yet, there's been mention of the idea, but it hasn't actually been implemented by Canadian courts. So this closely related test invites a consideration of whether a forum selection clause could get this broader meaning or this broader application and it goes beyond not only this idea of a close connection right this closely related test but there are also american cases that have adopted a, a related but different doctrine which is that a non-signatory can be held to be bound to a forum selection clause in the context of what's called a global transaction right, or a series of interrelated or interconnected transactions there's two different bases that the American cases are playing with. And in both of them, uh, broader extension is being given beyond simply the contracting parties. And we might, we might ask, I guess, at the beginning, well, why? What's, a ra what's the rationale for that? Because as the person at Border Force fairly quickly cottoned onto, that's just violative of privity, and we could just leave it there. We could just say there's, there's nothing that would overcome that particular hurdle. And what the American cases have, have said is the closely related rationale can and should be justified on the basis that if we didn't extend the scope of the form selection clause to closely related entities, then these affiliated entities, whether they're subsidiary corporations, whether they're officers of corporations, whether they're individual shareholders of closely held corporations, if entities like these in these close relationships were not treated as bound by the Forum Selection Clause, then the Forum Selection Clause could be avoided by strategic choices made by parties as to which claims to choose to advance and which parties to either have advanced the claim or which parties to sue as defendants. So tactically, you could overcome or avoid the effect of a Forum Selection Clause by cleverly structuring your claim. And what the court in, courts in the US, a case, for example, called Adams and, and Raintree has, has noted, would be far from the notion that giving extended scope to these uh, form selection clauses would somehow erode ideas of certainty and predictability. It's actually the other way around. It will erode the certainty and predictability that we would hope to get from form selection clauses if we don't, in these certain categories of cases, give them this extended effect so as to have them apply to non-signatories. The global transaction basis is different, and, and the rationale for the global transaction basis is generally understood in the American cases to be efficiency in the litigation process. And one of the key decisions in this area is by Justice Posner, who, as many of you will know, has a lot to say and to know about efficiency in the litigation process generally. Uh, he was dealing in a case called American Patriot Insurance with a case where there was a shareholders agreement with an exclusive forum selection clause in favor of Bermuda. There were a number of other agreements related to the proceedings that didn't have a corresponding forum selection clause. And Justice Posner, in confirming the correctness of the lower court's granting of the defendant's motion to dismiss based on the clause, he said, the contracts including the shareholder agreement are a package. The shareholder agreement happens to be the only site of the forum selection clause, but no reason has been suggested for why the parties would have wanted disputes under that agreement to be litigated in Bermuda, but not disputes under the other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. So he identifies squarely an efficiency element 
on behalf of the parties themselves. That is, this is what the parties, even though they didn't document it this way, this is what the parties would want for the purposes of litigation efficiency. But in addition to the party efficiency issue, the cases also in the United States pick up on public um, administration efficiency. That is, that there are public costs associated with litigation generally, that a multiplicity of proceedings is to be avoided, and a global transaction rationale allows for litigation to get concentrated into a single forum flowing out of a single factual matrix, even though it involves multiple parties and multiple claims. And we've seen that in other areas of the law. That's not unique to this area of the law. That is, in fact, one of the stronger reasons why, in certain cases, an exclusive jurisdiction agreement, even between contracting parties, might not be given effect in order to avoid what otherwise would end up being a multiplicity of proceedings. The paper then goes on to think about whether we could break this down and see whether the analysis might differ depending on the context in which it arises under Canadian law. So we look at the forum nonconvenience context, the anti-suit injunction context, and the context of taking a jurisdiction at simpliciter. Uh, because we wonder about whether the operation of, of how this might end up working in Canadian law might differ depending on the context. What we end up saying, um, the, the jurisdiction taking context is the, the tougher one, I suppose, for, for, for reasons which, which I'll explain. In the forum nonconvenience context and in the anti-suit injunction context, a judicial decision is ultimately a matter of discretion. Right? The court is exercising its discretion whether to stay proceedings or it's exercising its discretion whether to grant an anti-suit uh, injunction. And in those discretionary decisions, it's very common to see courts pointing to a wide, nearly unlimited range of possible considerations as to why it might reach the decision it does. And there's no reason why those considerations could not include uh, a forum selection clause, even a forum selection clause between one group of parties that might not necessarily encompass all of the possible parties. So it wouldn't surprise us in the context of weighing out a bunch of connecting factual elements and coming to a discretionary decision that a court might say, well, even though you're not, strictly speaking, a party, even though you're not bound by the terms of this forum selection clause, you're still going to be affected by it because of all of the factors that we are considering and weighing. And so in a sense, in that context, the court can duck a little bit the question of whether we would say the clause binds the non-party. And in fact, the court can slide by that question by simply saying, well, the clause will have an effect on the non-party or the non-signatory because of the way that that open-ended or open-textured discretion operates. Jurisdiction, in, in contrast, operates differently, and it's not a matter of discretion. And so it's a legal question, and the court has to actually elucidate a legal basis for taking jurisdiction. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada recently has been on a run of insisting on a greater degree of clarity and certainty in understanding what the rules are for the taking of jurisdiction. So the fuzzier kind of logic that might be all right in this weighing of factors in the form of convenience or the anti-suit injunction context is less likely to fly in the context of a court asserting that it will take jurisdiction over a non-contracting party based on a forum selection clause that it's not signatory to. One of the other things that flows out of the, the paper is, I come back to this idea that we started with at the beginning. Adrian Briggs, for example, is, is fond of making the argument that uh, jurisdiction clauses are clauses like any other. They're clauses of a contract, and so we give them effect the way we would give any clause in a contract effect. We differ from that position. We, we think that there is something distinctive about forum selection clauses, about jurisdiction clauses, such that they do, in other contexts, get treated differently from other contract terms. And if we can make out that claim, then that helps us buy into these American doctrines that also treat jurisdiction clauses 
differently from other clauses by giving them this broader effect to extend them to non-parties in circumstances where they wouldn't extend any of the other terms of the relevant contract to non-parties. And one of the leading examples of this, of, of the way in which we see jurisdiction clauses as just being different sorts of contractual terms is in the strong cause test, right? which is something that operates in, in Canada in connection with jurisdiction agreements. We borrowed it from the English common law, so it will be, it will be relatively known over, over here. And, and in one sense, we might think that this strong cause test is to be lauded because of how powerful it makes jurisdiction agreements. Right? We're going to give effect to jurisdiction agreements absent strong cause for, for doing so. But a contract scholar would back up and say, well, hang on. If, if you tried to tell me that you're going to give the other terms of the contract effect absent strong cause for doing so, they would think that was quite a significant derogation from contract. Right? There are bases for not giving effect to contract terms, and we know many of them, things like fraud or duress or unconscionability, but we wouldn't suggest that we could simply point to a set of other good reasons or factual connections and thereby not give effect to a particular substantive term of a contract. So it seems quite different when we're analyzing a jurisdiction clause to say we will let some of these pragmatic or efficiency-based concerns allow us to not give effect to a forum selection clause in certain circumstances. So it does look like a different sort of term. Another example, certainly in the Canadian context, where this looks like a different sort of term is in respect of breach. Right? It's a strange kind of contractual term that doesn't seem to attract damages for breach. Right? And I know that's an issue in the English context, and there are cases in the English context that try to argue about whether you can get damages for breach of a forum selection clause, but that's just not even on the Canadian radar as to whether you could get damages for breach of the, the term. There's an, interestingly enough, there's an extended discussion of this in an article in the, the journal that's hosting our, our very conference back in 2008. It was an article um, about uh, agreements on uh, jurisdiction and choice of law. It was a review article about uh, Adrian Briggs' uh, book by that name. Um, and Briggs is championing his view that these are contractual terms like other, any other. And the review actually went on to say, um, there, there's more to it than that, that, that it isn't just purely a matter of private law or contract law. Um, there are public law concerns, there are efficiency concerns, there are administration concerns that make uh, form selection clauses uh, somewhat um, different. So final thing I, I, I'll say before I, I draw this to a, a close, I suppose, then, uh, and, and something else that the paper plays with, coming back to this idea of jurisdiction being perhaps the more difficult way to see how we might integrate um, saying that a form selection clause binds an, a non-party is what, if we're going to do that, if we're going to take jurisdiction over a non-party based on a, a jurisdiction clause that they're not signatory to, what's our theory for doing that? Right? What's, our, what's our legal basis for saying that that grounds jurisdiction? And one argument, and the argument that we, that we prefer in the paper, at least in, in certain contexts, is we make the argument that that amounts to submission. That, that if you're going to come to the conclusion that the clause, because of the close relationship, binds the non-party, then it is inherent in the very nation, notion of saying that the clause binds the non-party that they have submitted to the jurisdiction, in the same way that a contracting party, uh, through the clause, has submitted to the jurisdiction. They clearly haven't subjectively, as a matter of subjective intent, um, submitted to the jurisdiction, but the consequence of saying the clause is binding on them should do the analytical work of saying that the jurisdictional basis is uh, plain vanilla uh, submission. The global transaction cases are harder. Right? It's much more difficult in the context of a global transaction like that Bermuda shareholder agreement to try to say that that in any way amounts to submission um, through having entered into the, the global uh, transaction. So that one, we struggle to think whether that could really be packaged in as a submission basis for, for jurisdiction. That then takes us, and I, I, only, I know I only have a couple minutes left, but it takes us to the club resorts decision from the Supreme Court of Canada in, in 2012, and the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, notion that we have these three categories for, for jurisdiction. We have presence, we have submission, but we also have jurisdiction based on what we now call a presumptive connecting factor. So in service out cases, we can found jurisdiction based on a presumptive connecting factor between the dispute and, uh, and the forum. And the question is whether, even absent a conclusion that the clause 
binds the non-party, even absent that conclusion, can we somehow get off the ground the argument that a uh, jurisdiction clause, either in a closely related situation or in a global um, transaction situation, constitutes a new, so hitherto unrecognized, but a new presumptive connecting factor that would ground jurisdiction. The Supreme Court of Canada has welcomed the creation of new presumptive connecting factors. Lower courts since 2012 have been busy creating presumptive connecting factors. Uh, and indeed, even in club resorts itself, the Supreme Court of Canada said that one of the presumptive connecting factors was a contract related to a tort claim. That was a sufficient connecting factor, um, a contract related to a tort claim being made in the forum. That seems perhaps tenuous, and it has in fact been criticized. But to the extent we accept that these kinds of things can be created as new presumptive factors, it's possible that we could also do that in this area here. All right, I'll close simply by saying uh, we've seen a lot of development in recent years in the Canadian context about form selection clauses. This is likely only to continue with the coming into force of the Hague Choice of Court uh, Convention recently. These American doctrines, the Global Transaction Doctrine and the Closely Related Doctrine, add yet another factor to the mix. And there are cogent reasons, we argue, why Canadian courts should not only pay attention to, but should adopt these doctrines as they're being fleshed out, as long as they are appropriately modified for the Canadian uh, context. Um, these bases for jurisdiction further the general rationale for forum selection clauses in the first place and serve to create efficiencies through the reduction of multiplicity of proceedings. Thank you. Excellently kept time. Thank you. Um, Matthias. <laughs> Many thanks, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's a true honor and pleasure to be here. In fact, to be again here after 20 years, I was an exchange student from Heidelberg at the academic year of 1994-1995. And I was, of course, thrilled uh, at the time to be at a place like this, at least uh, until the first night when I was arrested by the uh, campus police uh, of my college. Uh, I had been visiting the brand new library of the college, and I was deeply impressed with uh, what I saw there. But after a while, I thought it would be a good idea to leave the library. and. Uh, I found myself uh, all of a sudden trapped between the inner door and the outer door of the exit. And I thought, wow, that should not happen to a brand new building, in a brand new building, that the doors don't work properly. And I thought, what would I do? Uh, it was a time where there was, were not yet any mobile phones. I wondered what it would be like to be there until the next morning, but uh, there was no need to worry about that because what I didn't know at the moment, at that moment, was that I had triggered the silent alarm uh, <laughs> of the library and uh, the police uh, were already chasing to the place because they thought they would all, uh, at the end of the day, have, uh, they would, um, uh, uh, would have caught the bloody crook that had been stealing books uh, in the time before. But I assure you, again, it was not me. <laughs> and uh, the uh, police was great. Uh, they uh, granted to me um, full access to justice, in particular due process. And so I could explain my story. And we found out it was a book from the University of Heidelberg with a magnetic stripe that triggered the alarm. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, of course, feared that I would be on one of these lists of strange people, <laughs> troublemakers. Uh, 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 nevertheless, I got uh, the invitation to this event, uh, be that as it may. Mainly, I'm very grateful to be here to uh, share views about choice of forum agreements under the Brussels I recast and under the Hague Convention. As we all know, choice of forum agreements are of high relevance to the parties to regulate their business relations, to fine-tune their jurisdictional interests. And as we know from statistical data provided by the European Commission uh, during the recast uh, process, uh, parties make extensively use of them. At the same time, parties face many legal difficulties. One, of the, uh, one part of them we've just uh, 
uh, heard about, we will hear about other difficulties later on, and legislators uh, have made attempts to improve the situation by uh, enacting, suggesting harmonized law. For example, as we all know, the Hague, uh, con uh, the Hague Conference by the Hague Convention of 2005 that will enter into force at the end of the month as of 1st um, uh, October 2015, and also, of course, uh, there is the Brussels One recast of 2012 that has entered into force at the beginning of the year. And uh, we all remember that uh, one of the main objectives of the uh, recast was to strengthen the effectiveness of choice of court agreements. And uh, the European Commission it, um, declared uh, in its uh, proposal for the recast that the solutions would reflect the solutions established in the 2005 Hague Convention on the choice of court agreements, thereby facilitating a possible conclusion of this convention by the European Union. That has happened in the meantime. Whether the solutions adopted do, in fact, reflect the solutions in the choice of court agreements uh, 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 convention, that's another point. On the other hand, the Hague Con the Hague Conference has declared uh, that as a global organization with many member states outside the European Union, uh, the Hague Conference would favor a revision that aligns the community rules with the 2005 Choice of Court Convention. So there have been cross links between the two instruments already uh, during their respective making and uh, there are certain consequences from these cross links. First of all, there is maybe an intensified general interest in comparison. Now the texts are finalized. And also, secondly, there is maybe a sort of uh, imperative for coherent interpretation of the regulation with the convention as far as the regulation does reflect and maybe adopt parts from the convention, because if and to the extent that is the case, uh, these parts should be interpreted uh, coherently. On the other hand, there is a chance to interpret now the convention uh, by reflecting it in the regulation. And of course, um, the EU and its uh, member states uh, uh, their state practice in applying parts that are similar to the convention, the, that is state practice of high relevance and of high impact for interpretation of the convention. So there is also um, um, a connection from Brussels back to Hague. On the other hand, of course, we are talking about uh, independent instruments, autonomous rule makers, and uh, we will also certainly see different system rationalities, simply different solutions, different options. Against this background, I would like to compare important policy decisions that we can find in the two instruments, and to these uh, belong probably the following four, internationality of the case, the requirements for the validity of the agreement, the public policy control of the agreement, and last not least, lease pendants rules. Given that I do not even have 25 minutes, as I thought uh, until this morning, but only 20 minutes, uh, I would like to jump directly to points uh, three and four and uh, leave points one and two maybe to the discussion, probably simply to the written version of uh, my thoughts. Let's go to a public policy control directly. Article 6, litera C provides, a court of a contracting state other than that of the chosen court shall suspend or dismiss proceedings to which an exclusive choice of court agreement applies unless giving effect to the agreement would lead to a manifest injustice or would be manifestly contrary to the public policy of the state of the court seized. The policy decision underlying this provision is, obviously, that the derogated court uh, 
may check the agreement and invalidate it in order to prevent violations of public policy. For example, to be very clear, we are talking about something like expected violations of due process in the chosen forum. We are talking about a prognosis about what will happen in the chosen forum. And uh, if the expectation is that there will be a judgment rendered by the chosen court that violates the public policy and that thereby will not be recognized, then there is something that uh, can be called a public policy violation of the derogation. And in that case, that derogation may be invalidated. There is not only the level of um, the procedural violations, but of course there is also the level of uh, violations on the level of substantive law. There, are, there may be expected violations of fundamental principles of substantive law in the legal order of the derogated court. Sometimes this second level of substantive law uh, is framed under the term of uh, a loss of juridical advantage. But uh, we have to note, of course, that a mere loss of juridical advantage, a mere difference between the applicable laws of the derogated forum and of the chosen forum, does not yet amount to a public policy violation. Sometimes this uh, idea comes up under the term of an in tandem argument. That means that uh, a choice of forum agreement and a choice of law agreement must not operate in tandem to the effect that uh, important public policies of the derogated forum are circumvented. Sometimes uh, this public policy control is uh, criticized for introducing uncertainty to the process of attributing jurisdiction, true, but um, let me draw your attention to the fact that uh, many jurisdictions uh, know such a kind of public policy control. Let me illustrate that with a few examples and allow me to start with my own jurisdiction, Germany. You may have heard about a recent decision by the Federal Court of Justice, the Bundesgerichtshof, uh, in 2012. It was an Ingmar-type situation, but as opposed to the Ingmar case, there was not only the choice of law agreement selecting the law of a third state, but there was additionally an exclusive choice of forum agreement, in that case uh, in favor of the courts of Virginia, USA. And you may be surprised, or maybe not at all surprised, that the court decided as an act clear that EU community law to be more precise, the Commercial Sales Agent Directive and its implementations, the, its uh, mandatory character, um, um, necessitates, requires the court, the German court, to derogate this exclusive choice of forum agreement. There are other examples, older examples, I'm not going into details for reasons of time. We could refer to Bremen, to Mitsubishi, from Mitsubishi, there is the in tandem argument uh, uh, in the famous footnote 19. Similar ideas, other terms, but functionally probably comparable. Australia, we can find some examples. And of course, last not least, also UK, twice an Ingmar situation. The reasoning of these judgments uh, have been criticized and maybe they are not very uh, convincing, but at the end of the day, there is the idea present of whether in order to protect substantive policies of the forum, um, a choice of forum clause should be derogated. I leave it with that. My only point is to illustrate that many jurisdictions know some kind of public policy control, but the Brussels 1 bis regulation and the Brussels 1 regulation, they apparently do not have a public policy control. The judgment that comes closest to an answer whether there is such a public policy control or not is the case of Trasporti Castelletti. Uh, uh, you may remember that case. It was about a carrier's liability plus an exclusive choice of court agreement in favor of a member state court. And uh, the ECJ 
held, and I quote, that substantive rules applicable in the chosen court must not affect the validity of the jurisdiction clause. This is usually read as uh, uh, the decision to exclude any kind of public policy control, but this sentence can also be read as simply saying that a mere loss of a juridical advantage must not affect the validity of the jurisdiction clause. There's a very recent case that also touches upon the idea. It is a case that we will discuss uh, later in more detail. I will only focus on one particular point in, uh, of this judgment uh, in the case of CDC, where again the question arose whether the effective private enforcement uh, as decided as a requirement um, for national law by the ECJ in the cases of Manfredi and Courage would require to invalidate exclusive choice of court agreements to facilitate um, private enforcement, um, but the court again did not invalidate the respective choice of court agreements by deciding, and I quote again, binding effects of jurisdiction agreements cannot be called into question by the requirement of effective enforcement of the prohibition of cartel agreements. But again, this sentence can also be read as simply saying the substantive policy, the, su the policy of substantive law is not sufficiently threatened, not sufficiently jeopardized by the situation that was uh, to be decided that uh, an invalidation would be justified. So uh, the bottom line maybe is the question, would there be at all a justification, a sufficient justification for excluding right away and as a matter of principle a public policy control? Well, we could, all, we, we, could all, we could argue, as always, with mutual trust and say a mere expectation of a future public policy violation in the proceedings of another member state court cannot suffice to invalidate a European uh, jurisdiction agreement. But as we also know from the, uh, uh, from the uh, case law of the ECJ, there are uh, implicit, um, implicit uh, exceptions to the principle of mutual trust and to strict obligations of the member states. You may remember the case of uh, NS versus Secretary of State for Home Affairs. It is an entirely different area of law. It's about the Dublin mechanism to retransfer asylum seekers, um, a topic that is of uh, particular relevance at the moment. And as you may remember, under this mechanism, member states are required to retransfer asylum seekers back to the country, back to the member state where the asylum seeker first touched European ground. But the U European Court of Justice held that if there is substantial ground to uh, suspect that there will be violations of human rights, of due process in that country, there is no, there is no obligation to retransfer the asylum seeker, even though there is no express public policy clause in the Dublin mechanism. You could also, uh, you could also argue that uh, harmonized EU substantive law uh, is present to such a large extent that it's uh, hardly possible to think about situations in which uh, uh, a violation of public policy control could, could occur. Correct, but still there is autonomous law in the member states. And saying that would be arguing, I've been driving my car without any accident for the last 30 years, it's time to remove the safety belt and the airbag. I don't think that this is a convincing argument. Mm -hmm. So my conclusion or my thesis at that uh, point or on that point is uh, it is inevitable. It is uh, not possible to exclude the public policy control. Uh, it is always there. It is inherent. So we should make it express uh, 
we should uh, um, we should we should lay it down expressly in the Brussels one bis regulation. Lease pendants, Article Six of the Hague Convention says a court of a contracting state other than that of a chosen court shall suspend or dismiss proceedings to which an exclusive choice of court agreement applies unless a list of exception applies. I'm not going into details. The policy decision underlying this provision is obviously a far-reaching independence of the non-chosen court. The non-chosen court has the competence for establishing the validity of the agreement on its own, of course, according to the choice of law rule, to the law of the chosen court, but independently uh, from whatever the chosen court does. There is no compulsory priority for the chosen court. The non-chosen court may stay in favor of the chosen court, but it, has not, it does not have the obligation to. It may also continue proceedings if it believes, if it comes to the conclusion that there is an exception applicable. So we uh, find, or we can, we can notice, a tolerance for parallel proceedings in the Hague Convention. And the coordination uh, of these parallel proceedings only takes place um, by the rules on recognition. Well, Brussels one piece. We find in Article 29 the old dispendence rule, priority by first in time, but only now without prejudice to Article 31.2. And in Article 31.2, there is the new modified dispendence mechanism that <coughs> intends to somehow prioritize the chosen court. But how exactly? That is a matter, a matter of interpretation. And the interpretation of these rules has uh, turned out to be very controversial. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that there are quite a lot of people who have expressed views on that already. Others will have made up their mind. Uh, let me just try to explain what, in my view, could be a plausible interpretation. First of all, I think we are still on common ground that Article 31.2 applies only after the designated court has been seized as well. So if we look at the time before that moment, the non-designated court has the competence, the power to decide alone whether there is exclusive uh, jurisdiction from the, exclu uh, from the choice of court agreement. A mere objection of the defendant only bars jurisdiction by appearance, but does not trigger the modified Lispendence rule. There is no time limit in the new mechanism for the defendant to trigger the new mechanism, which leads to uh, the danger of abuse. The defendant can apparently wait until a very late stage of proceedings in the non-chosen court and all of a sudden say, oh, uh, by the way, I am now seizing the chosen court and then thereby I will trigger the new priority uh, mechanism. That should be fixed in the next recast, I believe. <laughs> if we look, uh, if yeah, uh, after the recast is before the recast, uh, <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's no question. If we, if we look at the time, after the designated court is seized, and if we first look um, at the role of the non-designated court, the non-designated court must stay proceedings in favor of the designated court if, and now there will be a list of conditions, the first two are probably still common ground, the third one is the most controversial one. If the agreement is not invalid according to Article 31.4, if to put it differently, uh, the agreement does not violate rules for the protection of weaker parties, consumers, employees, insured parties. Second condition, I think we are still on common ground. If the agreement is not invalid according to Article 24, to put it differently, if the agreement does not violate exclusive jurisdictions in Article 24, this is something the ECJ has already decided in the case of Weber in 2014 uh, for the old Brussels 1 regulation. 
And now the controversial point in the entire controver controversy, what else is necessary for the non-designated court to be obliged to stay? Uh, there are different views. There is nothing really clear, clear in the uh, new provision. I would believe that it is something like a prima facie test for the existence of an agreement, something like we know from uh, arbitration, but it is unclear whether this is in fact the standard of review, and if it is the standard of review, it is unclear how to use it. So we um, have the danger of inconsistent state practice, and there will be references probably to the ECJ. And uh, that seems to be enough to say maybe it's not the best of all possible solutions. Let's look at the designated court. The designated court will establish its jurisdiction from the agreement. The designated court does not have to wait until the first court has actually stayed its proceedings. This is something we know from recital 22, sentence 5. So there is certain ground on that point. But if I understand the rule correctly, but please correct me if I'm wrong, if there is no jurisdiction from the agreement for the chosen, for the designated court, what happens then? My impression at the moment is the designated court is required to stay its proceedings and uh, the priority of the court of first, um, uh, cho uh, first seized comes back, Article 29. The designated court is not empowered to decide about its jurisdiction on other grounds. If that is correct, the priority may shift back and forth under this mechanism, which is kind of strange and complicated. So if we boil down all that, what we were talking about, uh, on the level of policy. It is clear that Brussels 1 bis wants to prioritize one court, and if a, cho uh, a choice of court agreement is involved, it uh, wants to prioritize the chosen court, but there is residual competence for the non-chosen court to a certain unclear extent. This is, to say it again, very complex, and we have to realize that parallel proceedings are tolerated to a certain extent. Is there a better solution? Well, this is uh, the point uh, I would like to submit to discussion. Uh, let us think for 10 seconds, if I read correctly, about a, a solution that I would call Hague Elements plus Gotha Versicherung. You remember the judgment of Gotha Versicherung. It creates uh, res judicata effects uh, uh, for judgments uh, by member states on jurisdiction, irrespective of whether the lex loci, the lex fori processualis, I should say, uh, creates such effects or not. So it's a Europeanized res judicata effect. So judgments are binding for all other member state courts on jurisdiction. If we put these two things together, we could think of the following. We could simply delete all priority rules. That is an element we know from The Hague. We would face parallel proceedings, for sure. But together with Gotha Versicherung, we would have the possibility to have early interim judgments on jurisdiction with binding effect. We could think of additionally introducing an obligation to render an interim judgment on jurisdiction for each member state court seized with a matter and deciding on jurisdictions on the basis of Brussels 1 bis. The first interim decision would be binding for all other courts. As far as I can see, and as far as I understand my own uh, suggestion correctly, but please correct me if I'm wrong, no torpedoes anymore, anywhere. Clear and simple, but maybe I'm wrong. Please tell me, 
One rule for all situations, no special rule for chosen courts and other situations of list pendants, and last not least, a true reflection of the solutions in the Hague Convention. Thank you very much. We move to something slightly different, but a little allied. <laughs> so let me begin by um, some personal remarks. Yeah, but let's say our personal remarks because Carmen and I, having organized the previous conference uh, of the journal in Madrid, uh, we want to begin by congratulating the present organizers who are doing quite well, <laughs> despite the weather. <laughs> And uh, we want to tell you that it is a pleasure for us to be here this time on the other side of the conference as speakers and not organizers, and that it is a pleasure for us and a, a privilege uh, to be sharing these thoughts on jurisdiction and competition law claims. And uh, I'll try to stick to the time we have allotted. And I begin just by um, saying that we, we don't have this. I don't know whether. No. Do you want to, have you got a... No, no, I didn't, that's it. Okay. So, in the context of increasing cross-border litigation to, cover, to recover damages arising out of competition law infringements, and despite the fact that member states in the EU share unified rules for jurisdiction and establishing, uh, for establishing international jurisdiction, private enforcement of competition law has largely depended of, uh, on international legal systems. Recent legal developments could have meant a change in this scenario, but however, the Brussels One Regulation recast did not endorse any, any new rule or modify the existing rules that address these particular claims. Neither a whole substantive uh, harmonization has been proposed in the Directive 2014-104 on actions for damages for infringement of competition law. Finally, the question of collective redress has been simply addressed in a recommendation which is not binding from the Commission on June 2013. Hence, why I may conclude that the European Union has definitely re reinforced its choice or in favour of the regulatory competition when it comes to private, enforcement, uh, to private enforcement of competition law. It goes without saying that among the possible op options open to the plaintiffs, the choice may be influenced by national procedural laws as well as by the functioning of the national uh, judicial systems. But it is also true that this regulatory competition will be also dependent on the available um, choices as regards jurisdiction and the coherence of the system or of private <coughs> enforcement. It seems obvious that the enforcement of European Union competition law, be it administrative or a private uh, enforcement, has to be coherent as a whole. In this regard, while it is possible to find mechanisms and rules that allow for the coherence in the enforcement of competition law between different public authorities, one may wonder whether this is the case when it comes to private enforcement of competition law. In order to address this point, we need to analyze which are the possible courts that may be seized and whether this choice brings a real possibility of regulatory competition in a coherent way. A complete picture of the situation will also require seizing the impact of Directive 2014-104 on this jurisdictional structure. It is upon these elements that we shall consider whether the present system of private enforcement of competition law in the European Union provides a sufficient predictability, certainty and access to justice that may foster its success. It is our contention that while this may be correct in relation to follow-on actions, it is more doubtful whether we may affirm so when it comes to stand-alone actions. If this is correct, more emphasis should be put on developing mechanisms that facilitate stand-alone claims. It is also clear that fostering private enforcement of competition law would also need for the developments on collective redress, but due to the uncertain state of the art in relation to this point, we shall just ignore this issue in the presentation.
We shall consider then first the functioning of two main grounds uh, for jurisdiction under the Brussels one recast, namely the defendant's domicile and then the place of the harmful event in relation to follow-on actions. The recent uncited decision of the Court of Justice in case CDC will provide uh, interesting elements for interpreting these rules. Then we shall move to analyze those same grounds of jurisdiction in relation to standalone claims. As you know, follow-on claims are those actions for damage where the plaintiffs rely on the previous existence of an administrative decision that establishes an infringement of competition law. Let's consider first the application of Article A1 to follow-on actions. Should there be a plurality of defendants, this article allows to consolidate the claims that uh, ensure the co-defendants um, at the courts of the member state uh, where one of the co-defendants is domiciled as long as there is such a connection between the claims that it is expedient to decide on those actions together in order to avoid irreconcilable judgments. Article 8.1 has been a favoured path to seize jurisdiction in claims for damages arising out of competition law infringements. Usually, usually it has been taken for granted that such a connection between the claims against several members of a cartel is present in follow-on claims. This point has been confirmed by the Court of Justice in the CDC judgment. The Court states that in order to have recourse to Article 1, it is necessary that there is a risk that there be a divergence in the outcome of the dispute and that, that, that this divergence arises in the context of the same situation of fact and law. The Court says that such a circumstance is satisfied in scenarios like the one in the CDC case because the Commission had stated that the cartel amounted to a single and continuous infringement of Article 101 of the tr Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. A more controversial issue refers to the anchor defendant, that is the one which is uh, who's chosen to fix their jurisdiction. The UK experience has provided some uh, elements, examples, sorry, of a broad interpretation of the concept of anchor defendant based on the wider concept of undertaking under competition law terms. It has, it has led, this has led to solutions such as the one endorsed in the Provimi case, where an English subsidiary was held as the anchor defendant, even where it had not been the addressee of the Commission decision, because it was deemed to have implemented, not knowingly, the cartel. It is contended that this understanding is hardly compatible right now with the interpretation of Article 8.1 according to case CDC since the Court of Justice reminds us that, that this article should be strictly constructed as a derogation from the principle established in Article 4. It would seem thus that the Court of Justice identifies as possible defendants only those who have been the addressees of the decision of the competition authority. However, there is still a certain margin for member state courts in reputation because the, co uh, the court's judgment in CDC does not demand that the defendant has directly participated in the infringement. Therefore, a parent company of a cartel member that has not participated directly in the infringement but has been held responsible by the Commission could serve as an anchor defendant. At this point, I would like to consider the impact of Article 11 of Directive 2014-104 on Article 8.1 of the Brussels 1 recast. This Article 11 establishes the joint and several liability of undertakings that have infringed competition law with the effect that each of those undertakings is bound to compensate for the harm in full. Otherwise, the claimant has the right to require full, comp full compensation from any other of them until he has been fully compensated. However, this provision only applies in relation to big enterprises since small and medium enterprises are only liable to example charges. It will be interesting to see whether claimants who intend to sue big companies will still rely on the consolidation mechanism offered in Article 8.1 of the Brussels Recast and whether consequently the provision will be only left to cover multiple damages against uh, small and medium enterprises. Let's bring our attention to the place of the harmful event uh, as uh, recognized in article, uh, endorsed in Article 72. The Court of Justice has confirmed in case CDC that claims for damages arising out of competition law infringements are to be classified as non-contractual and therefore they come under the scope of Article 72. 
it has also confirmed that its settled case law on this article also applies to competition law claims. Therefore, in the case of an action for damages brought against defendants domiciled in various uh, member states as a result of a single and continuous infringement of Article 101 of the Treaty of Functioning, as established by the European Commission, each victim has a dual choice. First, she may sue before the courts the place giving rise to the damage, which is identified by the court as the place in which the cartel was definitely concluded or the place in which one agreement in particular was concluded, which is identifiable as the sole causal event giving rise to the loss allegedly suffered. The claimant is thus entitled to litigate in this forum for the whole damages suffered and against all the infringers. This is a very interesting twist or turn in the CDC judgment because the claimant may sue even those infringers who have not acted within the jurisdiction of that court. Thus, the court explicitly overrides its Mercer decision, and it does so because the concrete circumstances of the case, that is, the existence of a decision of the Commission that makes it foreseeable for the defendant, the defendants that they might be sued in that place. Being the idea of predictability a sound justification for this uh, interpretation and praising the advantages of having one a solution that allows to sue all defendants and for the whole damage in one court, one may consider nevertheless how often it will be possible to identify the place where the cartel agreement was concluded. Secondly, the victim may also seize the court where the harm was felt, namely the place where the additional costs resulting from the artificially high prices and the ensuing loss was felt. The Court of Justice states that it should be located at the registered office of the plaintiff. Again, the Court of Justice slightly modifies the traditional understanding of the place of resort because it gives the court seized jurisdiction against either one or several of the participants in the cartel for the whole of the loss inflicted upon that undertaking. One may concede that this solution satisfies the need for a close and clear connection of the case with the seized court, and it also helps the sound administration of justice and the efficacious conduct of the proceedings. Lastly, this forum will be predictable for the defendant since he, since he is clearly aware of who the victims are and where they are located. Along these lines, the place of the registered office of the victims may well not be only where the assets are, but also where the market has been affected. This underlying idea, namely the, that the connecting point reflects the place where the market has been affected, could be the basis to extend the interpretation given by the court in the CDC case in relation to uh, uh, enterprises to the cases where the claimant is an individual. In this case, it would seem reasonable to adopt the domicile of the claimant as the place where the loss was felt. Such an understanding would be predictable enough for the defendant inasmuch as this domicile is located in the market where the effects of the anti-competitive uh, behavior were felt. This leads us to the impact of Directive 2014-104 uh, uh, that, that this directive may have on Article 72 and the interpretation of the Court of Justice of Article 72. According to the directive, any natural or juridical person that has experienced damages, regardless whether she is a direct or an indirect purchaser, has to be able to claim damages. This statement will probably change the Court of Justice underst uh, traditional understanding of direct victim in the sense that second or third purchases may not be considered any longer indirect victims and then may have recourse to Article 72. It is considered though that the terminology becomes tricky even more when these claimants belong to a distribution chain and are located at several links of, uh, several links of the chain. This brings our reflections to the question of the passing on defense and the ensuing potential multiple claims that may arise both where direct and indirect purchases claim for damages on the basis of the same administrative decision. This directive asks for a consolidation of the claims so that there is no overcharge of damages. This will demand an increase in recourse to Article 30 of the Process 1 Recast and possibly a more flexible approach to this article so that the best place court hears the case regardless whether it was the first court seized. 
This attitude is already in practice when it comes to the allocation of cases between national uh, authorities, competition authorities in the European Competition Network, and the increasing importance of the principle of mutual trust between legal systems within the European Union suggests that the time may be right also for a change at the private enforcement level. So now I go uh, for the standalone claims. Private enforcement of competition law may take the form of standalone actions. This implies that the claims are presented while there is no previous administrative decision on the existence of a competition law infringement. Despite the inherent public interest of competition, these actions are initiated for private parties' sake. In these cases, the courts will have to decide whether there has been a competition law infringement, a restrictive practice or abuse of dominant position, and if that is the case, whether the claimant has suffered a prejudice for which he is entitled to be compensated. In order to avoid inconsistencies in the application of the European Union competition law and to guarantee its coherence within the European Union decentralized competition enforcement framework, Regulation 1 2003 includes some rules in order to coordinate the intervention of civil courts and administrative authorities. However, there is no rule for the national courts coordinated application of European Union competition law. Coordination between national courts and even the necessarily previous determination of their respective jurisdiction seems particularly delicate when there is no reference from an administrative decision, since the existence of the infringement, its authors or its possible victims have not been authoritatively established. Under these circumstances, it makes sense to reflect on the particularities of standalone actions regarding two issues. The margins for establishing jurisdictions on the Brussels one and the first place. And secondly, the incidence of the jurisdiction issues on the coherent application of the European Union decentralized competition law system. As to the margins for establishing jurisdiction under Brussels one, Olena has already explained the risk of irreconcilable judgments due to the existence of the same fact and law situation that calls, as long as it is predictable, for the accumulation of claims in one of the defendants' domicile according to Article 8.1. Whilst in follow-up actions, this is clearly derived from the resolution adopted by the administrative authority, when this decision is non-existent, the compliance with the requirements will be analyzed by the national court on the basis of the data provided by the claimants. The information about the parties, nature and extent of the anti-competitive agreement may be limited since it is difficult for the claimant to obtain it on its own. It will be not strange that the relevant and definitive data can only be obtained through litigation. Therefore, at the time of presenting the claim, there may not be enough evidence as to who are the authors of the alleged infringement and if their actions amount to the same situation of fact and law. Under these circumstances, two options can be envisaged as to the determination of the jurisdiction. The first one would entail a strict interpretation of the requirements that will leave no room for resorting to Article 8.1 since the connection between the claims and the risk of irreconcilable judgments cannot be definitively established until the merits have been analyzed and a decision has been made. The second would be a flexible interpretation of the requirements that would lead to consider enough finding indicatory elements that support the existence of the same situation of fact and law, together with enough degree of predictability for of that jurisdiction for the defendants. In this regard, it is possible to note that the European Court of Justice has already established that a full analysis of the merits is not required for the purpose of establishing jurisdictions on the Brussels one, and the existence of enough indicatory elements should be sufficient. Under a flexible approach, then, it would be possible to restore to this jurisdictional option in standalone claims. This does not hide the fact that it anchors the Federal Code 
that will be chosen by the claimant may not be the best place to hear the claim. Hmm? As to Article 7, number 2, the place of origin, which in CDC the court locates where the agreement or the household event was reached, raised the evidence problem again. The issue is whether the data that the claimants can provide would be enough to identify this place. If anyhow possible, the claim would cover all damages. On the other hand, the court placed the damage understood as the pecuniary loss at each of the claimant's registered office. As long as the national court establishes the plaintiff's initial condition as a victim of the alleged infringement, this place can be easily identified. It is interesting to note that in CDC, the court extends this jurisdiction to the whole of the loss experienced by the claiming victim without any further explanation. Elena has already elaborated on the possible relation of this conclusion with an interpretative trend based on the effects doctrine. In principle, it sounds reasonable maybe to think that there cannot be relevant economic damages for the claimant in a place that is different to its registered office. Obviously, this jurisdictional option leads to a firm actoris, and moreover, fragmentation of jurisdiction and the possibility of consolidating actions will be an issue. Applying the same rule to standalone actions would mean that the National Court of the Fleeman Registered Office would have to determine the existence of the alleged infringement, even when it may have a European dimension. In other words, when its effects exceed the national borders. One may wonder, first, whether a national court can adopt this kind of decision, and in the affirmative, whether its effects should be limited to the parties or be ultra -virus. In this regard, the establishment of the infringement is a civil and commercial matter, hence it falls under the regular scope of Brussels I, and there is, in principle, no formal, no formal reason to exclude the competence of the National Court. In addition, considering the exhaustive character of the prohibitions under Regulation 1 2003, the ultra virus effect has received academic support. In this regard, the cooperation that the National Courts receive from the Commission and from the national administrative authorities provides certain guarantees for the uniform and coherent application of the European Union competition law by these national courts. Nevertheless, the ultra virus effect of the national court decision cannot be guaranteed beyond national borders unless the decision is recognized through Brussels I. Since a number of national courts may be called to decide on a particular infringement, the risk of irreconcilable judgments is at stake. In this regard, the search of a fully coherent application of the European Union decentralized competition law enforcement system can only resort to the consolidation of claims through the related actions rules of Article 30, whose use is uh, discretionary. Moreover, as the regulation stands, consolidation of claims leads necessarily to the first says court without considering whether the second may be better placed to decide on the infringement. Similarly, under Article A2, it is the claimant who chooses the consolidating court without any possibility for considering a better option among those where the defendants are domiciled. To conclude, yeah. establishing jurisdiction for the private enforcement of European Union competition law on the basis of Brussels I system does not seem to present special problems as compared to other fields of law, in spite of the possible operation limits and therefore the material reduction of options available to the claimants. Hence, as long as the options available to the claimants are somehow limited, it is possible to conclude that the regulatory competition theoretically resulting from the decentralized enforcement system would not be as large as one could initially expect. However, this does not mean that parallel connected proceedings cannot be envisaged. Yeah? It is perfectly possible to picture claimants acting against the same or similar defendants before different national courts. It seems clear that, as such, the determination of jurisdiction is not enough to guarantee the effectiveness of the system 
nor as a consequence the uniform and coherent application of the European Union competition law. If rules on coordination uh, may be uh, even open in some floor for a, a forum convenience option, are not sufficient or do not allow for the best possible <coughs> solution. Elena and I would like to thank you very much for, for your attention and your comments. Thank you.